Hi, it's Mark Bernard here with the Bernard Institute for Cybersecurity Excellence. And today, in this video, I'm going to talk about cybersecurity assets. And I hope that you're having a great day and that you're enjoying the videos that I'm creating. I'm trying to create over 100 different videos on different topics within the mind map of my cybersecurity, Chief Cybersecurity Officer mind map. If you've seen it on the internet, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, please feel free to uh, subscribe uh, to my channel or my website. Uh, don't forget to like and share please these videos if you find them interesting and find them useful please do share them now without further ado let's uh, move into an explanation of cybersecurity assets this is the uh, by the way this is the second step in the risk assessment uh, process if you see my video on the risk assessment waterfall you'll know that the first uh, step was to do a scoping exercise which I explained in a, in a different video hopefully you've seen that by now and so now we're going to talk about assets and uh, and then following that we'll have a different video on vulnerabilities okay assets cybersecurity knows no bounds it's true uh, there's nothing that will stop cybersecurity threats or uh, prevent uh, 100% uh, a sort of a cybersecurity attack unless you and you, unless you take uh, good care of your infrastructure uh, you can reduce the risk and likelihood that's what you can do now there are six main assets uh, that I look at I look at information or data um, people software hardware telecommunications and facilities and the reason why I look at these six different assets is because if I uh, do a risk assessment of an information uh, database um, I'll find uh, certain uh, vulnerabilities and matching threats and impacts to the business. And if I treat them for that set of information, there's a good possibility that I'm going to be treating them for all information assets within the infrastructure because it's very difficult to implement a higher level of control for information, especially, uh, for example, if it's uh, personally identifiable information and you're worried about compliance with GDPR, PIPIDA or uh, FOIPA or PIPA, any of those privacy legislations or oh, in the California Consumer Protection Act. If you're worried about protecting information with those regards, um, you might have to use a higher level of security encryption or maybe some different techniques in order to mitigate the risk. And uh, when, once you do that, it's going to affect a lot of other information within your environment. So you can't really treat one data set uh, uh, much differently than other data sets without having some impact on them. But that all said, I did provide a video on classification schemas, and I will be talking about the uh, matching uh, information handling or uh, classification security standards that go with that schema. And uh, that will be in another video coming up. So be sure to follow me, um, uh, like the videos, and share the videos that I'm sharing with you uh, so that we can spread the word on cybersecurity. Now let's get back to the assets. So I mentioned that I look at information, people, software, hardware, telecom, and facilities. And the reason why they're grouped that way is because if I treat a threat or a risk or a vulnerability for one of those uh, assets, it usually has a widespread impact, which is a business benefit to the organization. Okay. So within every environment, we have data. We have databases all over the place. We have databases on our servers. We have databases on our desktops. We have databases on our uh, tablets. Uh, on our smartphones, we have data everywhere. Now, hopefully the most important data is on your server. Um, it may also be in the cloud if you're using cloud technology. More and more organizations are using cloud technology. So you may have a database in the cloud and it could be replicated. So you might have multiple instances of that data around the planet, in fact, because most of the uh, cloud vendors that I've worked with, and I've worked with quite a few, have data centers set up around the globe so that they can uh, you know, ensure that the data will be available if there is any kind of a um, catastrophic event like um, earthquake or, um, you know, a tsunami or, or fire or any of those uh, major ones that can create problems and knock down power and disrupt uh, businesses. So uh, those businesses, if they're in the cloud, they can always fail over to a different area of the planet and continue to conduct business. So we have databases spread all over the place. And we have people. So these are the two first assets. So we have data, people. People bring, um, you know, um, implicit knowledge, uh, tacit knowledge. Uh, 
uh, the experience of their of their careers um, and their schooling and any sort of professional development that they've taken. They bring that to the job. Um, they also develop new knowledge while they're on site, uh, which the organization needs to try and capture somehow in order to retain that knowledge. So people are important to get the job done. Data is important to be able to do the job. We have software. Uh, generally, all data requires software in order to, uh, first of all, to add the records, add data, to maintain the data, to share the data, to uh, delete the data eventually. Um, there's a lot of different types of software that have a lot of different types of functions. Uh, we mentioned a few uh, when we looked at the technology stack. We looked at some tools uh, like SQL that's used to data mine or uh, extract data or report on data in the database. And then you have enterprise resource planning systems that are used to manage large data sets that are used by most uh, enterprises during the conduction of their business. Um, so we have three assets listed now. So we have data, people, software, and we have technology. Uh, so we, we say hardware here, but we're talking about, uh, yeah, I guess it is hardware. It's because this is all about technology. So hardware, we have uh, servers. Again, we have smartphones, tablets, we have desktops. We have a lot of different technology. Technology has its own vulnerabilities. Um, software has its own vulnerabilities. Software needs to be patched. So does hardware needs to be patched. Sometimes uh, hardware has unique vulnerabilities. Uh, it may have certain thresholds uh, for environmental uh, conditions. So maybe it operates better at, you know, a minus uh, five degrees or minus 20 degrees. Uh, whereas if it gets too hot, maybe it begins to fail or falter. So that's uh, important to understand as well as mobile devices might be waterproof. Um, laptops might be uh, drop proof. Uh, you know, there's, so there's a lot of different types of vulnerabilities that hardware might have. And, uh, those vulnerabilities can be mitigated if we know about them when we do the risk assessment. And that's why we do risk assessments to draw out uh, the vulnerabilities and the possibility of them being exploited. Okay, and then we have uh, telecommunications. Now, these are dotted lines. So what this is, is this uh, is called a security zone or segmentation within a proper network. Okay, so we might actually divide different groups up. So we might provide uh, an additional firewall between the finance group and the and the IT group uh, in order to make sure that only uh, finance people get access into that environment. They can use the devices in that environment like printers, um, maybe servers, etc. so forth. Uh, the same goes with the technology group. Technology group, there's probably going to be a lot of people with privileged uh, authorities. Uh, and we want to make sure that those privileged authorities are not exposed to other parts of the organization that might have a lower level of security or they may be a, a little bit more vulnerability, uh, vulnerable um, to threats. So you can see we have many different groups here. Uh, every segmentation is divided through a firewall. Now, the security zone might actually be uh, defined by the, the primary or the not the perimeter firewall, but the interior firewall. So there's two firewalls. I don't know if you remember me talking about this before, but there's two firewalls between the organization and the a wild, wild internet. Um, and there's, there's a DMZ buffer in between uh, those two firewalls. <clears throat> and then you have this firm boundary. So the firm boundary is often defined by the physical location. So we have a wide area network. Uh, the wide area network is connected through the backbone of the internet. Uh, each facility, you might have a warehouse that has a network in that facility. Again, there's, you know, people, information, there's software in there. Uh, there's technology, hardware, there's telecommunications, obviously, uh, that are being used at the warehouse, maybe uh, at your own home uh, during the time that you're, uh, you're working remotely. Uh, perhaps you're using... Uh, uh, you have your own router that goes to the internet. You may not have any firewall, um, which is bad, but uh, unless your organization has, you know, taught you how to use firewalls and how to implement firewalls, you may not have one, but you may have VPN. And VPN may protect you because it's like a uh, hardened uh, uh, shell, if you like, or conduit that goes over the internet and protects people from s sniffing or snooping or eavesdropping on your traffic. So that might help. So there's 
different types of mitigating uh, security, of course. And then there's SSL, TLS that might encrypt the packets. And if you're really uh, sophisticated, you might be using other types of technology that actually uh, encrypt and encapsulate the packets and provide addresses on where the packets can be sent and where they can't be sent. Uh, so you have uh, warehouses, you have factories, you have homes uh, connecting to the internet, um, and then connecting to your office. So uh, there you go. You have six assets, six different types of assets. Uh, each have their own unique vulnerabilities. Physical property, uh, obviously, uh, they have to have physical security. You have to have access control. You may have a key, metal key management. Uh, managers may lock their doors with the metal key. You may have proximity card all the way through. You may have razor wire or walls around your facility, depending on where you are and what kind of threats uh, there are to your organization. Uh, you may have segregation within your environment. So maybe you have uh, the executive team on the seventh floor and you have IT on the second floor, but maybe you have finance on the third floor. So you can also segregate it like that if you own a building. Uh, if you're just leasing a space, then maybe within your space, you have different zones uh, where there are different groups. Maybe you have sales and marketing in one area of the floor, and maybe there's a wall and doors as well, uh, protecting them uh, from the other groups. Uh, maybe finance is se segregated as well. So there's a number of different ways to, to address all the different uh, potential threats and risks to the organization. And um, again, uh, you, you may have a security team who's uh, monitoring the traffic from the network, sitting over on the side, collecting their own data, and they're getting ready to respond to incidents. Maybe you have a honeypot. We've talked about honeypots in several of the videos that I've created because they are extremely valuable, but they do require resources in order to implement. So you have, need a server. You need to load it with data that looks realistic. Uh, you might leave it unpatched so that it looks a little vulnerable, uh, but other than that, everything looks normal. And then, of course, you need some kind of tool to collect data. So Splunk, for instance, is a popular tool that gets used. And uh, yeah, and you can separate sales and finance. You can sep separate the data center so that only IT authorized people, database engineers, uh, systems engineers can get in there. You might leave the privileged uh, users on the outside. Maybe they don't actually have access to the data center um, so that they have to requests the assistance of somebody and you have remote users and you have customers and then you have suppliers as well on the outside uh, connecting maybe to your network to provide uh, orders or requests for orders or maybe they're fulfilling some kind of materials requirement and delivering those and then you of course you have your customers who are purchasing your stuff online okay and there you have it so again information People, software, hardware, telecommunications, and facilities are the six main assets. That's what I'm going to be looking at in the risk assessment. This is step two in the risk assessment waterfall. If you haven't already seen the video, please go check it out, and you'll know where I'm talking about. And don't forget to review the scoping exercise as well that's on a video. I want to thank you for your time, and I hope that you found this uh, useful and enjoyable. Um, if you're learning about cybersecurity for the first time, you know, uh, feel free to leave me some comments. I'm trying to uh, make these videos uh, user friendly and uh, and reach as many people as I can. You can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. Um, I also have a website, BernardInstitute.com. Feel free to subscribe, uh, leave comments, send me messages. You have my email address here and my phone number. So I'll be happy to hear from you, happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, just want to make sure that we get that cybersecurity word out there and that uh, we help as many people as we can through this process. Thank you for your time and uh, take care now.